Hi, welcome to Shaky's Sports Journeys. Today we have a Life on the Ground episode coming to you um, with your host, Gassim Sheikh. And I'm joined by a fantastic guest today, um, a, a human rights lawyer, a criminal defence lawyer, um, a man who fights and fights for the people and fights in many, many high profile cases as well. I say hello to Amar Anwar. How are you, sir? Hi, Cassim. I'm shattered, as always, tired out. It's only half a day gone so far. I actually seen when I woke up this morning, I went to message you and you were still active on WhatsApp at four o'clock in the morning. Is that, the, is that the life of Amar Anwar? It is. It's not the... It's, it's, um, it's, usually it's a case of going to bed by two, three and then trying to get up by about seven at least. Or if it's, I go to bed early, then it's like normally waking up four or five o'clock and then I'm still working with the phone and then trying to get up. So it's trying to cram as many hours in the day as possible, which is difficult. Which is difficult. But listen, you need your sleep as well, Amar. So you get told you, I'm not getting any younger. So. Yeah, you know, you, I mean, for 50, I only found out the other day, I don't want to tell everybody, but you're, you're in your 50s. You don't look like you're in your 50s, so you're um, doing all right. But listen, sleep is important. So make sure you, you, you keep getting those hours in. Um, before we go any further, this has been a long-awaited podcast for me. Um, I, I, we've, I've, done some, I've done some chasing for this one, it's safe to say. You're a slippery... Yeah. Slippery, you're slippery. You get here and there, but look, it's been uh, it's, it's been one that I've been very keen to have. Reason being, I've known you probably now, Amar, for about going on twenty years. Maybe not so much on a on a personal basis, but it's probably more in the last ten years. But twenty years ago, we shared the stage. Um, it was the first time I came across you. It was the Azadi concert, um, and I got an award for Scottish Asian Sportsman that year. Right, okay. And you got an award as well. What was that award for? I think, from recollection, I think it was for, I think it was for for fighting for justice and contribution to the community, community services, something along those lines. Um, and I remember thinking, who's this slick guy in the three piece suit, man, going up to the stage? I've looking, got much slicker looking, over the look, years. Looking much dapper. Slicker over the years. <laughs> I bet. No, but from that day on, I've followed your career. Um, it's quite remarkable some of the things you've done, and we're going to we're going to talk about some of that today. I want to take you back first of all to kind of your childhood and kind of get an idea of who Amar Anwar is, um, uh, your family background, where you grew up. Please tell me a bit about it. Um, Mum and Dad were originally from Pakistan. Um, my mother was half Pakistan, father was Punjabi, Mum was half Punjabi. They were based in Karachi, and um, they had relatively unknown for that time. They came from a, a, a very well-to-do background, uh, very well-connected, um, and they had a, what I could probably describe as a love marriage. Um, and they decided to leave the country and come to the UK. And so they first settled really in, in Manchester and then they moved to Liverpool when I was one years old. And and if I put it like this, when I said my mom and dad were a well-to-do background, I think up until the point she came to England, she hadn't, hadn't even ever had to make her own cup of tea. So, you know, they had everything sorted out for them. And obviously it was a shock to my mother's system, came from a well-to-do background. And my dad, however, got on with it. You know, he'd, he'd left the lifestyle behind and working class in this country and just simply got on with it. And I hear stories, I used to remember like growing up, I remember actually looking at my mom and dad because they sort of like dressed almost, they looked like film stars, they were a beautiful couple. My father was in the 60s, late 50s and 60s before he even got married. He sort of had a bit of a jet set lifestyle, playboy routine, friends with Raj Kapoor, um, Feroz Khan, um, Pran, various film actors, still got photos of them. And um, But he left that all behind and, and worked, and worked day and night. I came to this country and then eventually when I was about one, we moved to Liverpool and that's where I grew up. And my father worked in the buses and my mom, I think my mom fought with my dad to get, she wants to go out and work. Um, and she was in John Lewis at the time, I think in the mid seventies, the first person of color actually to get a job as a shop assistant. I remember my mom telling me that um, the Asian community, Pakistani community used to come down to actually see her, that she's actually working in John Lewis. Cause John Lewis at the time was, the posh store, was a posher store in Liverpool. And, my mum, when she went for the job interview, and she'd been for a number of interviews, and she was very eloquent, well-spoken, um, and it was taught in a, a Catholic school um, in Pakistan by Catholic priests. 
uh, of Catholic nuns. Um, and her English was perfect. And she went along to the interview and she tells me that she, she had got so used to job refusals. Um, and it was because of racism. And I think at the end of 18, she was just sort of said, you're not going to give me the job because of the color of my skin. And you're not going to give me a chance. And they got taken aback and then decided to give her the job. So she started the job. She did that for a few years. And then she got um, a secretarial job, became a secretary um, just opposite where we lived. And my dad worked um, on the buses. Um, by the age of 10 or 11, you know, I was... I was never very good academically. I mean, I was my school reports, some of which my mom still holds on to, and some of which she gave me copies of. Always said that he has, he has potential, but um, I was always in trouble, and I couldn't keep my mouth shut, which got me into bigger trouble years later. Um, but at the time, it was like my sister was in the year younger, and she was always top of the class, and everybody'd always say, "How, how are you? How's he your brother?" Because I was constantly, you know being brought home, getting detention, primary school, in trouble, police, um, breaking windows, getting into arguments and fights. And, um, and by the age of 10, 11, I think it was like, they tried the local schools, the best schools. Um, Liverpool was pretty decimated under Thatcher. Um, I think it was just a few years later, we had the Toxteth riots. And um, Liverpool was in the downward spiral, as were most northern cities, and as was obviously cities in Scotland under, under a Tory regime. And my parents desperately wanted me to have a good education. And so, of course, they couldn't afford, but they, they went, applied to grammar schools. But my grades, to be fair, weren't good enough, so I wasn't getting into any grammar. And then my parents tell me that the, the, they, I always wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to fly. I was, wanted to join the Royal Air Force. And um, that's, you know, planes. I was obsessed with planes and... That's always what I dreamed of doing. And um, I remember, and I obviously needed to go to university. Parents want me to go to university first. Um, but the teachers told my parents, like, He'll, you're aiming too high. And, um, and obviously, my parents were eloquent, well-spoken. We'd go to every parents' evening. We'd always demand um, answers from the school of what's happening. And it was just a put down. I said, listen, he's not going to get to university. And aiming too high, and he's good with his hands, and he could do this, and he could do that but he'll never make it um, academically. So at that time, my father took a very difficult decision and decided that he would send me to private school because he used to do the, the, the bus company he worked for, used to do a private bus trip to picking up the kids from school and bringing them back. And they always used to be well-dressed and good morning and the afternoon and all this. My dad always dreamed and my mom said, well, it's impossible. We can't afford on a bus driver's salary and, and on a mother's salary. And, and my dad said at the time, I'll work harder. So my dad did three shifts a day, would come home, take off his uniform, go to sleep for an hour or two hours, and then get up and go and do another shift. And then for several hours, and then come home, and my mom got a job as a secretary to, to, to pay, pay me through school. So I had the, the gauntlet, which I had to run through a working class community, where I, when I would go to school, when I'd get to school, nobody for the first year and a half believed that my dad was a bus driver. I was the only, I think it was only me and one other person in the whole school. Um, that were of Asian background, but the other person's son was a doctor. And I, when I said, my dad's a bus driver, they didn't believe it. Um, they thought I was lying. And, um, and then eventually they found out. But it was deep-rooted racism at the school. And, and then, bizarrely enough, when I'd come back in my uniform and walk home when I got a bit older, then you'd have to run down the street to stop getting the doing of the local kids because they're thinking I was the private school kids. So it was like the best or rather the worst of both worlds. Yeah, I grew up for that, and I grew up for the environment of Liverpool. I wanted to join the Air Force, join the Air Cadets, dreamed of becoming a pilot. And I think I was at 17, I think, we went to RAF Cranwell for an officer's training course, passed all the exams, everything was fine, and then it was medical part of it. And it came back that I didn't have 2020 vision to be a pilot. And that broke my heart. That's all I had wanted to do in school. were like, well, you know, he's doing his sciences, doing really well. And I, by then, I'd up my game. I still had a big mouth. I liked to debate and argue. Um, I can imagine. And then they said you could do engineering, go in to do engineering. And I didn't really want to do engineering. I hated maths. I hated physics. I hated chemistry. Those were my subjects. And I was predicted to get, and I had a choice between, I think, um, I think it was military college. Um, it was the Royal Air Force Military College, which I could have gone to, um, or I could go to university. But of course, I wanted to go to university because I thought I was going to wear a uniform for the rest of my life. And, I went, and when my grades came through, I literally had completely screwed them up. It was like a sense of arrogance, probably young arrogance, and just heartbroken and a combination of my parents not keeping an eye in the latter year because they thought I was fine. I had predicted grades of two A's and a B. And of course, 
Um, I got D in, two Ds and an E for my A-levels. Complete shock, broke my parents' hearts. They'd worked so hard to get me to that school. And, um, and that was it. So I was going to go back to school, repeat the year, because my dad demanded that I do that. Um, and there was, I thought, well, okay, even with those grades, thinking, well, should I go to the RF? I didn't want to go to the RF college straight away because I thought, I'll be where I want to go to university. So I remember when I'd applied, I said, Glasgow, my mom said, there's no way you're going to Glasgow. You go to London or you go to Manchester. So I had two places offered at London or the RAF college down south. And um, I ended up in Glasgow and clearing, got a place in Glasgow for mechanical engineering and came up to Glasgow in 19, 1986 with a view that once I finished university, I would obviously go back to Liverpool or down to London and continue. And then within the first couple of years of university, um, you know, it was only me and my sister, so extremely close family, but life changed rapidly, you know, with, with the introduction to university, I broke down my racial, cultural, political barriers, um, and the politics changed the course of my life, I suppose, politics of race. I didn't know all of this. I always thought, just by the way your career has gone, that you must have always just been focused on being involved in a in the legal in the legal sector and human rights and you know fighting for the people. I thought that must have been kind of inbuilt in you, but it actually wasn't wasn't at all. You had other other dreams and other avenues, but you also mentioned your know, parents when they first came over here. They faced discrimination because of race. You experienced it in your childhood, coming through in school, then even going into a private school and experiencing different type of discrimination. Is that then what kind of formed the route that you ended up going? You've, you've now come to Glasgow Uni. You're in uni. You're, you're, you're not studying. You're not studying law. No. So how does it go from there? Well, I mean, I was in a bizarre situation because my dad was a working class Tory. He loved Thatcher. We we're in a bizarre situation where the politics he tried to. Um, give to me were well, right wing politics um, in, in every in every, from every perspective because of the background he carried with him from Pakistan so it was a bizarre situation being the son of a bus driver having those politics and coming to university so the first two years I mean I, I, I wouldn't talk to someone like me you know um, I, I was right wing I was abusive I was intolerant um, I had uh, and then what happened was I, I was I became president of the Glasgow University Asian Student Society. And in that process, after the first two, three years, I mean, I became a engineering, I wasn't interested, but was interested in partying and enjoying myself. Parents were throwing up their hands in despair, thinking, what the hell's going on? I was um, president, and then I was sharing a flat with medical students and dental students. Um, and the majority of them were Asian. And when they went to the third year clinical, uh, when they went into the third year clinical, um, class it they I, all I used to see was my friends used to work extremely hard from morning to night and I was the one that was always partying and they were they did really well in the first years and then when they went to the third year of the dental school it was common knowledge to everyone that if you were Asian or you were black then you were going to end up either being kicked out or failed or at the bottom of the class and that's exactly what happened to some of my friends who were in the top five ten percent percentile and then you go into clinical and they start to get failed and of course, my friends, were closest friends, were coming home heartbroken, upset, failing the exams. They'd worked so hard; they had no chance. There was racism, you know, from some of the lecturers. And I decided that I was going to speak up, and that was my first real public introduction to, you know, the politics of race. And I remember going to speak to the the, the students' representative council at Glasgow University in the John McIntyre Building, and going and speak. And I was literally got short shrift from the student president and. And then I was out one night and I met somebody from a left wing group and she said to me, what are you talking about? And I was out and I was like, you are all the same political activists and student. I said, somebody comes to you for help and you don't offer it. She went, no, come back with me. She came back with me and she briefed other people and I went to a full student meeting and won the vote. And then it was voted that there would be an extraordinary general meeting. We had about 400 students. I marched at the front, first march I'd ever marched at. 400 students marched on the university principal's office. They tried to occupy it. Uh, sorry, I need to turn the light on here. <laughs> um, they occupied it, and um, and there was a vote to basically students had been kicked out that they should be they should be allowed back into university. There should be a full scale investigation into the allegations of racism. There should be anonymous marking introduced at Glasgow University in the Dental School, and it was a one to two year battle. And by that point in time, I had realised I thought engineering is not for me. 
you know, I started losing friends, which you all have seen, Cassim, with the cricketing stuff that people start to turn your back when you yeah. start to speak the truth or you start to speak about racism, people you think are your friends. They're all there for the, the good times. But when you actually start to tackle stuff, it, they start to feel defensive. And I quickly realized these people who are being defensive had a guilty conscience. But also I saw, understandably from my Asian friends, the panic set in because if they were associated with some of the people thinking they were feeding me the information, some of them, of course, were feeding me the information. And so I started to lose friends, left, right, and center. But during that process, it became extremely hard. And then eventually we, we, we saw a route through, and it was Pat Kane, who was the rector at Glasgow University at the time. And somebody from the, one of the lecturers, who was a foreign uh, overseas lecturer, came to me anonymously and said, go to the yearbooks at the, the, the final year, yearbooks that they print. Um, at the dental school, get copies of them and you will see how lecturers talk about students as if using the N word, using the P word, talking about how they fail these people because of the color of their skin and making jokes about it. And I was like, really? So they wouldn't give them to me, but the, the rector pack came, went in and came to us. And then it got printed on the front page of every national newspaper. And then the university implemented changes and investigations, the Commission for Racial Quality became involved. And, and that sort of flung open the door in terms of changing things at Glasgow University. And, and by that point in time, I'd realized university didn't want me there. I wanted to switch to sociology and politics. And I thought journalism is the one for me. I want to become a journalist. I wanted to write because I was writing what's. And I switched careers. And then, um, and, and so that was 86. That was about 1990. I changed. So I'd hung on to my parents and had an up by that point when I, you know, was on the fringes of far left groups organizations was going to demonstrations the first Asian boy you know on demonstrations and I, I remember it vividly as like the real turning point in my life that was the night of the 4th of November 1991 and the day before the week before we had demonstrated all the students marching on student unions on the principal's offices and we'd, we'd, we'd occupied it was about student loans against the Tory government were bringing in student loans at the time so theoretically ending um, free education and I the, 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 on the 4th of November we occupied the principal's office and took control of it and in the evening we were doing fly posting so I went out with some young students and we were going to put up posters for the demonstration next day on Ashton Lane which is a hubbub of bars and beer gardens at the time it was just the ubiquitous chip and there were some bars along the street winter's night 8 o'clock 9 o'clock and I go down and people are keeping watch for police. And normally what happened is police call you, they take your posters off you or they give you a chase. I had all these posters and I went run, but some of them were younger, students younger than me didn't know which way to go. So I went up in one direction, stupidly hanging onto the bucket and the posters thinking, I'm not letting go. And the students ran the other way and I could hear footsteps running behind me and I ran along the grass behind the bars where now there's beer gardens and um, got to the edge of the concrete and heard these footsteps and just felt somebody grab me from behind and I go down ground and as I shared it's like all right I've stopped and almost instantaneously the first thought that goes through my head is my mom because I would phone my mom every night and I thought I'm getting to jail tonight but I had felt, as I went down the ground I felt my head being pulled back my face smashed off the pavement and I felt my teeth starting to crumble and then my head was pulled back again and teeth smashed off the ground again and teeth came out and I, I passed out seeing pain and when I came around I looked up and I could see a policeman and a policewoman were dragging me back. I could feel blood on the top row of my mouth, feel nothing there. And I was like in agony. It was, I was terrified. It was frightening. And it's that moment when people say your, your whole life flashes in front of you. It's one of those moments where you just say everything fires from your head and thinking, tonight I die. And I thought, tonight I will be one of those black boys that dies in the back of a police van that I'd heard about so much growing up half a mile, a mile away from Topstiff in Liverpool, where there'd been the race riots before I'd left where black people were regularly murdered, incarcerated, miscarriages of justice. And, um, but I'd never really looked into it, knew of it. It was, you know, we saw it in Manchester, saw it in Talkstuff, saw it in Brixton, and grown up watching that. And um, and I thought, I'm going to be one of those. And when they laid me down outside the Jubik's Shank wine shop, and I, I passed out, and I came around and I looked up, and I was scared, I was crying, and I was in pain. And I just, I just wanted... To, to, to be out of there and um, and I asked the question why and the police officer said to me when I looked up I asked the question why because I looked at their faces and I recognized their faces and realized they could have just followed me to university because there's police officers keeping guard outside to make sure we didn't smash the police officer and they could have just waited till I got there and I thought there was you know it was like I mean within 30 seconds I would have been the Queen Margaret Union which I saw a sanctuary if I'd made it but I didn't make it 
And I asked the question why, and he said, this is what happens to black boys with big mouths, and I was kicked in the face and the stomach. Peter, then I passed out. And every time when I came round, I thought I die tonight, um, or I scream, fighting. So I, I was lie down on the ground, couldn't get up, and I just screamed for help. And eventually there was, I found out later on, there was a German teacher trainee that shouted she was going to run and get help. And the lane started to fill up with students shouting. Um, and then the a police, police had called an ambulance. And one of the paramedics had said, one of the boys, who was my friend, who'd come down to the lane, had to, was allowed to get in. But when the police arrived at the Western Infirmary, which was teaching part of the teaching hospital attached right to the university, the place was full of lecturers and students who already heard the news. And when I arrived there, um, I was taken into A&D and the, 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 um, the hospital doctors asked the, the police officers, the two police officers to leave the room because they, said I, they were in charge of me and I wasn't in any state to run away. Face was smashed up, two and a half teeth smashed, blood all over the place, terrified, able to walk and crying my heart out. Um, and they, they basically did a bolt. They did a runner um, from the hospital. I didn't face any charges or anything, nothing at all. And at the time before I went into the, the ambulance, I was told that we're going to take you down to the police station. We'll, we'll do you. And I, I knew that I left that hospital in the police station, then far much more worse was going to happen to me. And I would be fitted up with charges as, as has always happened to people of color in this country. And um, and that that was the breaking point or that was the making point. Um, and from there on, I became um, hard left, radical, anti-racist activist. I was every demonstration. I was in the front line. I was in riots. I would riot. I can say it now. I would riot. I would be involved in, in riots where we started it. But I would have involved in most of the time in riots where the police started it. And I fought tooth and nail. I became the Scottish organizer for the anti-Nazi League. We tried to shut down the BNP headquarters. I received far, far right combat 18 Nazi put on hit lists for the work that I did. Um, and I worked with my way, way for university. The university, I think, had had enough of me by that point in time. Um, and eventually in 94, I finished university. Um, I wanted to do journalism. I worked for the BBC for a bit with, um, I think, around about the same time that we were all in a group, Sanjeev Kohli, um, Osama Amir, um, and a few others. They were like taking on Asians, training ups, got training with BBC. And then I got a job for the Commission for Racial Equality as an equality officer. And around about that time, I think 95, my case finally came to court. Now, in the four years it took me to get my case to court, I had something like I was in court about five times. I had had about 25 attempted arrests, arrested several times. And each and every time they were just basically, and they just basically would swear and say, get the hell out of Glasgow. The more they did that, more determined I became that either I'll die in Glasgow or I'll win against you. I remember my lawyers at the time saying to me, you, there is nobody in Scotland has ever won a case against the police, a civil action against the police for a racist attack. And my point of view was, well, just because they haven't doesn't mean I can't be the first. Um, and I went to court, Glasgow Sheriff Court, with my parents at that time. And I remember I was sitting with my parents and it taught me a lot of, a lot of lessons that court case did because it went on, I think, over about three days or so and the police officers came in extremely arrogant and they came into court and answered questions. And I remember my father starting to cry, and he was a hard disciplinarian. I was terrified of him my whole life. Um, sitting next to me in tears and turned around to me and says, so you were telling the truth? Because I didn't tell my parents until six months after it happened, until I had a plate in my mouth and they came up and I hadn't gone home, so they didn't see the scars or anything. And I remember taking it out and my dad saying to me at the time, you must have done something wrong. Because my dad was very pro-police, pro-British police, believed in the system, believed in the Conservative Party. And I went, this is why I didn't tell you. My mom started to cry. I cried because she wanted to have been there for me. And I said, I'm fine. Um, and it, it damaged me personally. It, I suffered from post-traumatic stress. The police wanted me examined and then the police psychiatrist says, not making it up. He, he's suffering from post-traumatic stress, which must be from this, you know, catastrophic event or from this event that happened to him. The nightmares, the panic attacks, the anger, that thing. And I went to court and we won the case. I won the case. I became the first Asian person, first person of colour to ever win a case of civil action in Scotland for racist attack. And sadly, I'm still the only person to ever have won a case against them for that. Um, and I came out of the courtroom and I remember walking down the street with my parents and saying, I've, I've decided what I want to do. And they were like, what? I said, see that street, Carlton Place, where all the lawyers' offices are. I said, I'm going to work on that street one day. I'm going to go back and do law. So my parents brought their hands in despair. Oh my God, <laughs> he's going to go back to university again. And then I asked them a year later, so look, I want to go back. And they were like, what do you need? 
you want to go out and party? I went, no, I know I need to do this. Because I, I, it was like two, you know, it was two, two roads. And I said, I'd done all the roads before, which meant they were either going to end in trouble or I'll end up in jail or end up bitter and twisted. But in all that time, I'd met so many people this happened to, people without power, people who were oppressed, people who were despised, people who were disbelieved. And I thought, I need to put something back. I need to channel it. I need to get rid of that or channel that anger, not get rid of it, but channel it in a positive fashion that would allow me to give something back. And I decided I'd go and study law. And of course, I, I, I then in 2000 um, finished, did accelerated degree and then did my law degree in 2000, I finished um, law, I became a lawyer. I'm, I'm fascinated that I, there was things that you've talked about that I didn't, I, I knew I, I've done, done my research on you, but there was little other finer things that I, I didn't know about. And you're right, that moment could have could have made Amaran or it could have to, totally broke Amaran were as well. A lot, a lot of people would have crumbled under that kind of, you know, knowing that you're going in against the police, totally up against it. The odds are stacked firmly against you as it is, especially being a person of color. But the fact that you got through that, do you think that has been the, the, the catalyst for where it's then gone from there that you're able well, to... I've, I, think it's been, I think it's been one of the catalysts. And what, what I do know is that ever since then, I've always used these lines. I've said that um, there was two lessons learned that night. And I've said it in meeting after meeting in 21, in the, 20, in the 30 years that have um, been since the attack. Um, and I've said that there was two lessons learned that night. The police learned one lesson that this black boy's mouth got bigger and bigger. And the second lesson was learned by me was that justice isn't handed to you on the plate. You have to fight for it. And it's not judges, it's not politicians, it's not police officers, it's not newspaper editors give you, it's ordinary people that fight for it. Um, and I was indebted to individuals who basically got me ready for court, who stood by my side, who, who were there to wipe away my tears, who were there to hold a frightened boy's hand going into courtroom and my parents to be there to actually to get through it i could have easily just given up and walking away and i was in for the long haul and sadly since then some of the cases i've taken on have been for the long haul you know choco that we'll touch on 18 year battles you know um emma caldwell you know um sex worker who was murdered 16 years ago fighting for the family to get justice Look at Shiki Bio. By the time the public inquiry starts this year, it'll be seven years since he died in police custody. So that's just some tip of the icebergs of cases. I'm looking at newspaper cuttings on my wall. You know, I did the case of Atif Sadiq. Um, he was the first Muslim to be convicted of terrorism offences. I came out of the courtroom after his conviction, post Glasgow airport attack. He was accused of being Al Qaeda. There was no evidence of being Al Qaeda. I instinctively believed that he was just a stupid boy going on the internet looking for answers, but he was given a nine year sentence. And I came out of court with his instructions and I stood on the steps in the court, said that he was an innocent man. We were going to appeal that this was a miscarriage of justice uh, and spoke at length on the basis of that. And he was given his jail sentence. And then I was told I would be put on trial for contempt to court. And I remember that time, there was probably a certain amount before, like I've achieved, hey, this is eight years later, this is some, you know, um, um, 13 years later after being attacked or winning, my, 13 years after being, winning my case and I thought, I, now, you know, I'm at Pinnacle, I'm doing really well career-wise and I was taken from there right down to the bottom and thought, this is a little black boy getting his mouth kicked in again. And I remember at that time, real repercussions for me personally, family-wise, publicly, lawyers, people saying, just apologise, just back down. And I went, if I back down now, I'll be backing down for the rest of my life. And I've made a promise to that young man and to his family that I will fight for his freedom and we will win his appeal. But I have not done anything wrong. I followed the instructions of my client. Why am I the first UK solicitor to be put on trial for coming out of a courtroom claiming that is, you know, that was it. So I, I won my contempt court, contempt of court case and then I won my prosecution in front of the Law Society. And then I ultimately went on to um, win out of Sadiq's case. But it seems to me, but every so often, every every year, and I've said this to, to some people that you've had on here, I've said it to, to, to Wakas, who's a friend of mine, treat him as a younger brother, who became a lawyer, I say to many um, black Asian lawyers who come in, I said, you do spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder. I do. I always know that I have to be work 10 times, 20 times harder, that everything I do will be checked, that if something comes out of my mouth inadvertently, then it could end up losing me in my career or have somebody complaining about it. So I'm always conscious of that. 
that um, it's not been an easy process. But yeah, I mean, it, 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 I, would, I, I think my life, my mom often asks me, says, if you could turn the clock back, would you do it differently? And I, I go, I said, that night changed the course of my life. And I think it changed it for the better. I think I've been blessed over the years to meet individuals, to meet families who have said that justice is a right and not a privilege. Um, families in the midst of their grief have set up campaigns to, you know, because, you know, the dead can't cry out for justice is duty of the, the loved ones to do so for them. And they've done that and they've taught me so much. And when people say to me, oh, the law and all that, I said, it's those families, it's ordinary people who've taught me what the law is about, taught me what justice is about. It's not the courtrooms, it's not judges, it's not the QCs, it's ordinary people. They're the ones who inspire me. Um, and, and, and I think I'm lucky to, to, to have come into contact with them. You said looking over your shoulder quite often. I do think that sometimes I look at the cases that uh, Amar Amwar, you, you've mentioned some of them just now, um, they tend to a lot of the time be against the police um, because of wrongdoing by the police or, you know, the Sheikh, Sheikh Ubayu uh, case in particular. I mean, I've seen you post the injuries on Twitter numerous times now. I mean, how, how else did he get those injuries apart from when he got put into that van? And, you know, what, what happened prior to that? There's no evidence of anything else happening prior to that. You know, but, how can how can just, you know, is that... These I mean, with Sheku, Sheku's case, we have a pending, we have a pending public inquiry, so we won't go into too much details of that. But I mean, the position really was that the police received a report of a black man walking down the street acting with a knife erratically. Um, six police vehicles were dispatched. Um, two officers arrived first. Sheik is walking down the streets, half past seven on a Sunday morning, palms stretched out, not carrying a knife, doesn't display or brandish a knife. The police officers are told to approach carefully. He's attacked, first of all, Sheku is attacked with CS spray and with batons. He doesn't do anything, he tries to walk away. He's attacked again with CS spray and batons. He doesn't do anything, he tries to walk away. He's attacked again by another police officer. He doesn't do anything. And then there is a, on the fourth occasion, there is an incident with another police officer. But Sheku was down on the ground within less than 30 seconds of the first two arriving. Six detention officers or more um, are involved in his detention. He's handcuffed, ankle cuffed, leg restraints. His body is covered from top to bottom in bruises and lacerations and a broken rib. The, the other officers have little or no injuries apart from grazes on their you know, hands or whatever from rolling around the ground. The officers are described as being over all over him. There's batons being used. And when you put that in the context, this is May the 3rd, 2015. Fast forward to George Floyd. We're lucky there's a camera there. Seeing what happens when you put your knee on the back of a black man or a white man or whoever's neck it is and hold them down, asphyxiation particular hemorrhages in the eyes, the red blood spots, which Chiku had, that they start to lose their life. And I don't know what you are like with your kid, but I know with my kids, when there's a wee one, I always say, kids, get off them, because you can't breathe, because you can lose consciousness rapidly. It's like being in a rugby scrum or something where people pile on, you have to pull people out, because you can lose consciousness. And this is like bearing down, you know, offices over weights of 25 stone, six foot four on top of them. And then the public imagery, Described as Sheku, you know, the first leak that goes to the press is that a policewoman has been stabbed, seriously injured. Well, she wasn't. Sheku didn't have a, didn't attack anyone with a knife. They didn't have found a knife on it. So he, did, he didn't stab anyone. He's the one who ends up dead, not anybody else. Then it becomes the police officers attend the police station. And I reverse the story and I say this. If it was nine bouncers at a nightclub who were detained, uh, you know, let's say nine bouncers detained somebody and they held him down and his body's covered from top to bottom and bruises and he dies. Do you think the police would wait and take him to a room and put them all together and question them and say, oh, well, we won't question you or you don't want to answer questions. They would take him separately. They would arrest them. They would detain them. They would kick their doors down. They would treat them as they do because they were suspected of killing somebody. And then they would try and get to the bottom. Of it. In this case, the nine police officers are taken to a canteen and kept in the canteen together for some several hours. They refused to give statements to the independent body that are appointed by the Lord Advocate to investigate deaths in custody, the PUC. Um, and they refused to give them statements. In fact, they refused not just to give them statements that day, they refused to give them statements for 32 days. In the meanwhile, statements are coming out of a, of, of, of a pitch of exactly what happened. A story has been built up in the public domain and the family is saying, we're not speculating. The family have always said, we refuse to speculate. They, they thought the, if he acted out with the law, the police had a right to act legitimately, reasonably, and 
And in this case, they believe that the police did not do so, but it was the actions after the event as well. Several different versions told to the family, several versions told to collect his partner. They were told it was members of the public that found him lying dead in the street. They were told it was members of the public that called um, you know, um, an ambulance. And then ultimately, when the word starts to get out, they then tell the family, but actually he died at the police hands. He died in police custody. So it begs the questions of what's going on. And then it took six years of campaigning. I remember the family sitting opposite me at the desk and the first word was mentioned was race. And I said to the family, do not mention the word race. And they were shocked because they thought they'd come to Amber Amor. And I went, we need evidence. We must bide our time until we have the evidence. And obviously, ultimately then, several months later, a member of the family of a serving police officer came forward and said that her, uh, you know, her brother had acted in a racist manner previously and had an allegation of serious violence against him. There was then allegations made that he hated black people and uh, you know, there was insulting comments, uh, alleged insulting comments, racist comments made in relation to this. And of course, that blew the whole lid open. Um, but it took six years till eventually a public inquiry is due to start. It's been now in, in May, it will start. That'll be seven years after Sheku's death. It'll be one and a half years after the public inquiry was announced. And the family have always said to me, it took demonstrations of four days in the United States to get several police officers arrested and to be put on trial. And there was a trial within one year in Scotland where we pride ourselves on race relations, on being so against institutional racism. Six years of campaigning didn't get them that, didn't get them justice. And they know that they'll never get justice, they'll fight for justice, but they want the truth to come out in the public inquiry. And for those who are responsible, not just police officers, but every rank who had their fingerprints on it, the PERC, who were supposed to investigate as an independent body, the two Lord Advocates previously, who failed to prosecute or investigate it appropriately, their staff, it's, it's, it, it smells all the way to the top. And this has never happened in the history of this country. So many people didn't want this public inquiry to take place. Um, they said, have a fatal act inquiry. Of course, a fatal act inquiry can't portion brain. So the family have a big battle on this hand. This inquiry will probably take some two to three years. Um, Hamza Yusuf announced in the parliament, it was hoped that this will be groundbreaking, that this will change policing in this country forever. In the same way, it was hoped that the Stephen Lawrence inquiry would, but I'm not naive. I mean, at the end of the day, tell me this, 30 years later, there still isn't any other person that's ever been successfully, you know, a civil action against them over a racist attack. Tell me other cases where, you know, police officers have actually been sent to prison over a racist attack in Scotland. They're saying we were completely 100% racism free. Because it's just, as you always like to say, we're part of society, then how come it doesn't apply? You mentioned the Sergi Singh Choker case as well. Yeah. There, that you know that was eighteen years as well. Of yes. is this because the message I'm getting here is when you're a person of color and you're up against the institution that's dominated by white people, you 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 suffer. How can I mean? How did that manage to go on 18 years, Amar? Well, I mean, Sergei Singh Choker was a baptism of fire for me because I came out of the fire, being a fireband campaigner, winning my case against the police and then just becoming a lawyer. And I remember I had criminal convictions against my name and my lawyers at the time said to me when I'd gone to law school, you need to keep your nose clean um, in order to be able to get accepted as a solicitor. And it, what happened was in the final year of my law degree, um, Sergei um, Choker came to pass. And what happened was in November 1998, he was brutally attacked in a racist attack. He was stabbed and killed by, and three men, three white men were held responsible. And um, the people were arrested. And, and to be fair to the police, which is what I always said, because it's always easy to hang the, you know, the hat or the blame on the police. At the time, the police did their job. They arrested the three men. But then it was agreed that the two men would be released and only one man was held in custody, a man called Ronnie Coulter. And a year later, and the family were told to keep quiet. And the local Asian council, Bob Chadder, was told not to tell the community, not let anybody find out this isn't a racist attack. And obviously in the backdrop, there's all the Stephen Lawrence inquiry going on. So it's this heightened awareness that everybody in Scotland say, we don't have that problem. Or we don't have that problem because we don't have people of color. We don't have that problem because we don't have black people. We don't have enough Asian people. And, um, and a year later in March, 99, um, I'm down in England. It's, it's a week after the Stephen Lawrence inquiry report has been released. And we're talking about a post McPherson paradise and sea change and everybody's apologizing. Of course, in Scotland, they say, we don't have the same problems of federation. We're still saying it now, um, we don't have the problems. And um, the, the man, Ronnie Coulter, walks free from court and he says that the other two did it. And the judge uh, may rest in peace, a very senior judge, Lord McCuskey, never scared to speak out, blew his top at the end of the case and said, 
He wants to know why the Lord Advocate, when the three men had been named in his court in this horrific murderous attack, why it was that all three were brought to court. I then came up to Glasgow. I contacted the lawyers who I was friends with Imran Khan and Michael Mansby, the lawyers for Doreen and Neville Lawrence. And I asked for the support and they said they gave me 100%. I then contacted the trade unions and I came back up to Glasgow the very next day. And I contacted the family, I went to the Gurdwara and um, I met up with Manji, um, who I regard as a sister there. And they regard me as a son of the family. And I said, I want to meet with family. She was highly suspicious and eventually the meeting was arranged to meet with her and uncle, as I call him, Mr. Choker, the late Mr. Choker, Darshan Singh Choker, and um, uh, his, his wife, Gurdev. And I went to the house, met, and they said, what can you do, son? And, and I said, I gave like, it was just like five points is always the way I would do it. It's like, well, we want, we want the two other two men retried. We want a public inquiry. We want justice. We want to know what's gone on in terms of race. And I remember Mrs. Choker saying to me at the time, how long will this take, son? And I said, probably a year, six months to a year, naively. And of course, then, you know, there was a huge campaign. It was galvanized by the support of the Lawrences. The trade union movement was outstanding because we worked from the fire brigades union. Day and night, they gave us their offices and we built a massive campaign that had us marching up and down. Thousands of people were involved to the point eventually that men were arrested and then they were put on trial the following year. And of course, the following year, they came to court and they walked free because they blamed Ronnie Coulter. And the evidence came out that Ronnie Coulter had had the devil's advocate at tattoo on his back. They stood the film about a, a, a lawyer who gets off of guilty men. And um, I boasted about killing, using the word P, um, killing a, a P and got, getting away with it. And the boasts that were going around the community. So these other two men walked out of the court celebrating. I was raging. And I went out as a very young, angry lawyer to the steps of the court for the first time. And I lambasted our criminal justice system, accusing it of being institutionally racist and said, you, you know, um, in the manner in which they dealt with one system of justice for the rich and a very different one for poor people and for black people. Um, I didn't know the storm that I had created because I obviously said, you know, there was no black judges. There was no Asian judges, senators of the court. There still aren't, actually. Um, and I said, you know, where's the justice? So at that time, the, the, the government then, uh, it was a Labour, Liberal, and up until then, every politician, every political party had supported our calls for a public inquiry. As soon as the case finished, we were stitched up. The government announced a, a judicial inquiry with Sir Anthony Campbell from Northern Ireland being brought in to look at the prosecution, so to look at the head boys, and the Raj Jandu, an Asian guy. And at the time, I said about the tokenism of appointing an Asian man who had benefited from the very individuals who we were targeting being brought in to do the job. And he was to look at the race. And I said, why is it not one inquiry with the guy at the top doing it? Why are you letting the sergeants go in to investigate the generals? Because Raj was just a, a junior advocate. And we fought for six months and eventually we walked out of the inquiry along with most of all the ethnic minority bodies and institutions in Scotland. We condemned it. And I remember Imran Khan saying to me, he says, be prepared. This inquiry will now go for the jugular and they will attack you to rid themselves of any responsibility. I said, I said, I had nothing to do with prosecuting the case. I fought for the family. I was a young law student. I became the chair of the, the Choker Family Justice Campaign. And of course, a year later, I remember sitting in parliament, tears rolling down my eyes as I sat. We had like about two hours to read the report in a room. Me, Manji, Mr. Choker, Mr. Choker. Things have already been starting to be leaked day beforehand. So rubbish me, to attack me. And Imran has said, give me the best piece of advice at that time. He says, you will be attacked. You will be vilified. Do not lower yourself to the standards and do not attack because they know that you're used to punching back and hitting back, but you do that for your clients. If you focus on yourself, then it's game, set, match over. And of course, we then went into pressing public, uh, we went to the press conference and we sat down and Mrs. Choker had never spoken before. The family would always agree at the point and then I would speak on their behalf, agree the statement. And Mrs. Choker went, banged her hand on the table and went, I want to say something. And we were all shocked, me and Angie, Mr. Choker, and she went, how dare you? She spoke to me, how dare you? attack this boy who has done nothing but stand shoulder to shoulder with my family. He says, my son's dead. I hear his voice every night. You never gave us justice. Mr. Choker, well, you know, her, Mrs. Choker's grandfather was a Victoria Cross winner, you know, in the First World War. They believed in the words British justice. Mr. Choker said, justice, the word British justice ran through his veins. He believed in it implicitly. It's why he came to this country and he was shattered. And Mrs. Choker's only thing, concern was, how dare you? And I was crying my heart because I was trying to hold it back and saying, like, how dare you attack him when he has done more than anybody else to support his family? And of course, we got, we tried to campaign and fight for a public inquiry. And eventually, Mr. Choker had cancer by that time. So we stopped. 
family gave up hope. I gave up hope. And then fast forward to several years later, and Imran Khan from the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry phones me and says, Anna, you need to go for a change in the double jeopardy law in Scotland. We're getting it changed here. And if we're getting it changed here, we're going to go for another prosecution against the five who killed Stephen Lawrence. So, of course, I approached the government at the time privately. I approached the Crown Office, who I had good relationship with by that point in time, because I'd worked my way up as a lawyer. And people who started my peer group have also worked their way up. So I got to know, became friends with Leslie Thompson, who's Solicitor General, and Frank Mulholland, who's now a High Court judge. I approached them privately and approached the government. The law was changed, and we were the first to cross the door saying, reopen the case. And then it was announced the case would be reopened in 2014. In 2015, I, Mr. Choker, sadly passed away with cancer, and I gave the eulogy at his funeral. And I said at that funeral, I said, he, more than any person in my lifetime told me that justice is a right not a privilege and I was proud to have known that man and proud to have been part of that family treat me as one of their own and their son and the following year we went back to court and it was heartbreaking because we sat in the same spot in the same courtroom we thought this is jinx sat with Mrs Choker on my right Manji on my left holding their hands when the verdict came through and Ronnie Coulter was put on trial for murder and when the verdict came through and said guilty we just we started to cry and um it was a fear in my heart because I remember before Mr. Choker was crying and he argued with me saying, we don't want to go ahead with it. We don't want to push for it. And I said, just trust me. Trust me one more time. He says, son, can you promise me you will get us in South, get us justice this time? And I went, promise you. As soon as the words left my lips, I just thought, I've made a promise that perhaps I cannot keep. It's for the Crown Office and the police to do the job. But we kept the pressure. And then when we won, Mrs. Choker turned around to me and says, now I have peace. My husband and my son are at peace. My only son is at peace and I can get on with my life. And we went and held each other in the room and then we came out and did a statement and somebody asked me, he says, is a mood for celebration? And I said, there's no mood for celebration here. It's relief. And this family can now have done their duty to their loved ones and they can get on with their lives, but there are other families who have suffered. And of course, in the, in the back of my mind, I knew about Sheikh Bayo and all that. And, when, and it took 18 shy, one week, I think one, two weeks shy of his murder, of Shajit's murder um, to, to actually get justice long haul but that's exactly how long it took for the Stephen Lawrence family to get justice 16 years we've been fighting for Emma Caldwell's case to get justice Shikubayo seven years and sadly people often assume oh <laughs> they often assume because of the cut of my jib and the suits that you wear that well you're a millionaire and you're making lots of money and what people need to understand is see for cases like this our criminal justice system doesn't give you a penny you don't get paid to do cases like this because the legal aid board won't give you money to campaign on behalf of the family because they say, oh, it's up to the police. No, it's up to the Crown. When the police and the Crown aren't doing their job, who's going to advocate? Who's going to advocate on behalf of our community? Who's going to fight their corner and say, that needs to be done? Um, and yes, yeah, so that, that that took 18 years. That's a long answer to your question. So. That sounds, that sounds as well. I mean, how do you keep, this is more off the keep, how do you personally, when you go home, You've got, uh, you know, you've got, you've got a family, you've got kids, you've got, you've, you've got so much going on with your life. How do you, how do you switch off? How do you, you know, it must, I can't even imagine. I mean, even listening to you there, I can, I feel myself getting emotional going through that, that journey with you as anyone would, and, and a, a, a mother and father have lost their son. I've experienced my mom and dad lose, lose a little brother, my, my, their son for, for different reasons, for, for an illness but murdered like that, and then all those years. But how do you keep yourself together through all of that? It's difficult. Being honest, I have my dark moments, you know, on and off over the years. Mental health has suffered. You know, you have dark moments. You feel completely alone. You, I, I have the flashbacks. I have the post-traumatic. I have, you know, the anger and stuff, and it's like peaks and troughs and that. Um, and I, I, I sometimes do sit there and I sort of think to myself, I want peace. I want to be able to switch off. I, I, I want to enjoy life. But then it's almost like the cases I've taken on, the families that I deal with, they inspire me to keep going and I have to keep going and keep going. But I, but I, I mean, I'll be honest, it is tiring. And it is tiring, and it's tiring fighting day in, day out, having to have the same arguments time and time again. But I suppose I'm lucky because, I mean, I've, I've, I've pulled you and the boys up and Majid and yourself and all that. And sometimes it feels like I'm a granddad, you know, talking to, to my kids because it's, the, it's like the experience of 35 years of dealing with this. 
And it's almost like the same picture is replayed out. The words might have changed, the individuals might have changed, but the actions are still the same. And, um, and, and, and yeah, it's difficult because, believe me, I mean, I mean, my children are bonkers, but they keep me sane <laughs> because I throw so much into this all try to have quality time with my children and try to be a good father and be there for them. And it is, and it's hard because of the work that I do to do that, but I try and devote as much time as possible. But there's, there's, I, I'll be honest to say that I am always tired, mentally tired. And then it just needs something to sort of pick me up and to keep going. And it's sometimes it's that inspiration. It's that person that you meet that you just goes, right, get up go back at it again and then you sort of it's just up down up down and I'm trying to stay in straight line and also I'm, I'm I think I'm blessed by having people in my life who keep me on the straight and narrow who keep my feet on the ground who remind me of who I am of not to have the ego of um you know taking taking the mickey out of me and pulling me back down and um and knowing what my own you know faults are and weaknesses are and how to how to how to deal with them um and I suppose also, I, I would like to think that over the years I've mellowed because the approach I would adopt now from let's say on the steps of the High Court of 2000 is entirely different now in 2022. Um, a, a different approach would be adopted. And I think probably that's an experience of becoming a lawyer, much more measured, pull back, hold back, wait for the evidence, do it. But also trying to find a way of planting the blow that is much more devastating and people don't switch off because people don't want to see folk who are shouting and screaming at the TV because it puts people off. So it's being calm and having your words selected and picking them carefully and then using them to maximum effect. Great advice. Great advice. And it's good to hear you because, you know, sometimes people just assume that see people like yourself are bulletproof. You know, they're just used to fighting or arguing or, you know, standing their ground and, and you know, they must just be thick skinned. So I appreciate your honesty there because I've often wondered, I mean, I'm involved in, in the institutional racism um, scandal that's come and, and involved in Scottish cricket now. And I'm telling you some nights, I'm just like, oh, I feel a bit emotionally drained from it. You know, it's, uh, I want change. I want the change, but I feel, but the things that you've been involved in for 35 years must be must be draining. Let's, let's get to a, a day that uh, is very recent for, for all of us, especially Glasgow, Glasgow, Glasgow people. Uh, Eid Day, summer 2021, um, I get a, I think a friend of mine phoned me and said, um, you know, something's happening at, at, in Pollock Shields. Um, you know, there's an immigration van there, and there seems to be some people. There's people getting together. Then on on Twitter, I seen a, a little clip that people were congregating. I, did, I had my, my my wife was working. My daughter uh, was with me at the time. My, my two year old daughter, and I thought. I'm going to I'm going to head down and, and just see what see see what's happening. So I stood at the the top of the street, and it was actually just as I arrived, you walked past, um, and I got to see firsthand when you when you first went on to say to say your piece where you you didn't hold back against a certain Preeti Patel. But tell me about your day. Where were you? It was obviously E day. You had just it was E day. I'd arranged to meet the kids, take them for lunch. I was supposed to be the next day, I was supposed to be going to the Isle of Gear, um, a wee Scottish island, because I was supposed to be appearing in their Channel 4 six part in ranking murder series. I was supposed to be acting the role of the lawyer. So I was supposed to be in hard isolation, but it was like, I was meeting, it was Eid, so I had to meet the kids, done a bit of work, had my suit on, um, arranged to meet the kids. And then that morning, text messages started coming in from local activists, a, a friend of mine from 20 years who I met 20 odd years ago, Mohammed Asif, who's an Afghan. A, um, a, a Afghan refugee, and we marched some 21 years, 20 years previously um, on the streets with a thousand asylum seekers went to Site Hill after Fazat Dag was brutally murdered and marched with them demanding justice. And ironically, that morning he starts taking and saying, Amr, I mean, down in Kemio Street, there's something going on, the deportation van here, it's Eid, and text kept coming. And I, initially, my reaction was like, there's not going to be much because my understanding always was when there's a, a forced immigration removal that the police will attend and that's going to happen. But then I started seeing text messages start to come through. And then another friend who's a counselor, she contacts me, says that they're sending the riot vans. At that point, I was sitting, I was like looking at the phone, the kids were like, Dad, get off the phone. And I was like, so I said, send me the pictures. So I took a video and I counted in the video that I got about 40 riot vans. So I thought at that point, I, I can't live with myself if I don't go down. So I went, I, I said, um, I said to the kids, around, take the pop shows. 
So they're like, oh, we're going there for us. No, oh, we'll go for a wee wander. We'll get your cheese and chips from Halal Kebab at some yeah. point. Yeah, aye. So if I'll go down there, so I have my mask on, and I thought, well, people won't realise it's me when I come in with a mask. And as soon as I sort of walk in, I think Mohammed Asif, the press will turn around and go, Sam Ram will start doing an interview and all that. And I said, this is a disgrace. Asif announces me to the crowd. Huge chair goes up. I go and speak. And I, I, I just, I think what I said was like, this was cynical. It was cynically motivated. Um, that people should not move, they should get on the phones, and they should tell the people of Glasgow to get down here. How dare they try to carry out this deportation? We are standing united as a community. These are our neighbours. Um, and talked about the horrific record of, you know, um, of Priti Patel and this community will not be moved and they will not be divided. I then, that point, I'd phoned the police before I'd gone down, spoke to the area commander and asked who's the commander on the ground, and they said, well, it'd be good if you come down. And I know from, from about the 25, 30 years of working with police and the community in, in policies there's been so many occasions where it's either been at a knife edge or at a boiling point where things are going to kick off one 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 time was chris donald when the bfp were trying to come in and we united the community and as a community um uh, and chris's mother who was brutally murdered in the racist attack by um by pakistani boys in the community and, and chris's mother was one of the first ones who despite her grief came out and said that we don't want these people in our community and we will not be divided and we managed to hold things together and i knew at that point when I went down there and I marched out and walked past with my kids, counting the vans and seeing around the corner, you know, over 100, 150 police officers, I went, if they go in, this community will go up in flames. People will not tolerate it. It is Eid. The people you could see there was a sea of humanity, black, white, Asian. You know, you had people who were Muslims, non-Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, Jews, um, completely, you know, young and old, gay and straight. Um, you know, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's quite a, mixed community now from probably 20, 25 years ago and quite a hipsterish community that I've moved in. It's a great area to be living in. And I thought, they'll destroy all the hard work. So I asked for the commander and um, went, and I remember having my three kids with me, so they're like walking through and stuff thinking, my kids have been going to demonstration with me since I was a weekend and now they just go, oh no, another one. And then I went up um, to the police van and said, look, I'm not going to speak out of this at all, the commander's there waiting. So they escorted me up to the van and said, rather go inside to add this unit van or whatever with black windows. So I went and I said to the police officer, constable, and I went, I said to the kids, right, you're going to stand with him and he's going to keep an eye on you. You're not going to move. And if you move, you're going to get arrested. So the cops looking at me, the commander obviously said, look, can you keep an eye on Mr. Anwar's kids? So I went in the van and we had the discussions. Thank you so much for coming down. And the discussion really revolved in general around two issues. And I said, you've only really got two options. And what's the first option? The first option is release the men into my custody, guarantee they will not be arrested. Let me march down with them to the local mosque. And I will say to the crowd to disperse. I said, the people will peacefully disperse. Nobody wants violence here. Um, that's the only thing. And I said, look, Hamza Yusuf, Nicholas Sturgeon, they're on social media. They're contacting, you know, the, trying to contact Priti Patel's office. There's no movement. This is deliberate. It's cynical. It's motivated. There's going to be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people more by 4 or 5 o'clock here. You're not going to be able to stop this. And, and then, she, then I was told, she told me, she said, like, that's not possible. They were trying to get in touch with the Home Office who were robbing them. And I said, well, are you doing the bidding of the Home Office? Are you doing the bidding of the people of Scotland? I said, you're a police service of Scotland. You're not police service of Priti Patel. This is on our steps. This is on our thing. And you have to weigh up public order. And I used the argument the week before because I sat in the Chief Constable's group that deals with COVID powers. And I think the week before we'd had, or a few weeks before they had the Rangers thing going on, fans marching through town and, uh, and, and the, you know, marching for the city centre in Joe Square. And I said, at that time, you know, there was all the talk about you had to weigh up the threat of serious outbreak of violence against maintaining public order. And you didn't want to provoke serious public disorder, so you basically let them do what they needed to do. And I used the same argument. And then she said, well, it's not an option. And what's the second option? I said, second option, you have 40 riot vans, you have hundreds of police officers, use your batons, send them in, break up the code, get them in, deport them, take them to Dungate. And said, well, clearly that's not an option. I said, well, that's the only two options you have. There is no middle road. And of course, then I said, well, can, can, can you give us some time so, so we're going to have to go and speak to some people? And I know they were frantically trying their best to extricate themselves from the It wasn't the situation they wanted to be in. And then I went back into the car and I went, people should not be moved. People get on your phones, get the message out. We will not be moved. These are our neighbours. The only time we will move when these men are released from custody. Um, this is unacceptable behaviour. And of course, about an hour and a half later, the police come to get me and they say, come back and says, right, we're releasing into custody at that point. There was relief because I knew at that point, if we lose this, then I'm the one that's going to get attacked because I'm the one who's the lawyer who's there on the ground and gone and done this and said this. Um, and I didn't think that it would be good, but they did agree, to be fair to them. And they went, so it was an agreement was released. I said, well, I want to go in the van, speak to the boys in Punjabi. They were Sikh men. Um, 
organized where, which way we were going to march. And then the police put a cordon around us to stop the men getting crushed. And then I said to Kerry, well, you can surround if you feel that we're not going to. And it, and it was a brilliant. I remember when I opened the door to the van, police officers, and I got in the van and I turned around and I went, it's this people of Glasgow, they freed you. And people had a huge cheer that went yeah, on. Yeah, so it was, you know, just absolutely amazing. Um, a real rush. And then when we got out of the van and we marched and people were clapping and cheering, it was a party atmosphere. And we marched down the streets to the mosque and then got up on top of the steps and told people, you know, thank you so much, but we want people to disperse now. Because I said to the police, if people disperse, you must disperse and leave the area. And I said that, but the police will leave, you leave. Well, chanting and all that. And it was a wonderful day. And I didn't realize that time, got, those pictures have gone around all around the world. Everybody's seen it. I remember like giving one of my friends, my, my two daughters, before we'd gone back into the crowd when I left the police van, because I knew at that time it could kick off. And I didn't know. And I said to my son, you stay by my side and don't leave my hand. And he was only 13 at the time. Um, and I said to, because my daughters were 10 and um, six. And I said to my friend, can you take them? I keep holding them and just stay on the edge. And so she took them away. Because we didn't know. I didn't know if it was going to erupt. I didn't know if the police were going to attack. At the end, they, I'm a member of the public. Um, and if, if, if the attack goes on, I realized that I could lose. But I said to my son, you stay by my side. Because I thought, you need to learn too. You need to know, know what goes on in your community. You need to know what racism is. You need to see how things develop. And it's a bit of political education, even at a young age. And, um, and when we got to the end, it was brilliant. The crowd dispersed. Fantastic atmosphere. It was I have to say it's like in my top three moments, political activity oh, to picture. actually get, you know, freedom. I mean, I've got I've got a picture, which I think one, let me just get it off. Yeah, way. let's have a look at it. Let's see the picture. Um, and it was probably the top three moments of my play. And that's me in the middle with the mask on. Yeah. Marching out with the it's men. And the that's new road. You know, Kenyon oh, Street. It was absolutely... Um, an amazing, amazing day, and, and um, power of the people, eh, Amar? Power, yeah, of the power of the people, because that's what I said. They said those people would not be raised. And test me to a young man who, at half past nine or nine o'clock in the morning, came out of the, the house when saw was happening and dived underneath the vehicle. That's the right. Of the van, the van man, as they called him, I wouldn't move if it hadn't been for him. The people wouldn't have had a chance to to, to organize and to get there. There's people across the political community. So many of faces I saw who were part of the. Have community. you spoken to him? Have you spoken to the van I man? I spoke to him at a time because, funnily enough, when I went to the van, the the police said to me, says, can we do us one more favor? And I was like, what that says, the man, the van man's not moving. And I went, what do you mean? So I went down and I was like, got on my knees and I said, look, you need to go. When well, no, I want a guarantee that these men will be released. I said, I'm giving you the guarantee. And he went, who are you? And I went, I'm I'm one. And he went, I'm I went, like, oh, great. And come out. And then he said to me, can you guarantee I won't get arrested? And I spoke to the police and said to me, brother, no, can you do me a favor? That boy's been there. We're getting them released. Can you're not going to arrest them? And they went, no, we won't arrest them. So we was to go in a huge chair for it. But if he hadn't taken those actions at the time, young white people, incidentally, who did that and then immobilized the whole community, right, cross-section, black, white, Asian, um, th those men would have probably been deported to India. Oh, such a powerful, such a powerful day, a day that you know I was proud to proud to witness. I am a well done to people of Glasgow. Well done for, to you for going down and 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 raising your voice and such a powerful day. There's been we've talked a lot about discrimination, racism, and there's been two incidents in particular for sporting background that you've been involved in in recent times. The first one was where Rangers footballer Glenn Kamara um, was playing in a, a European game. Yeah. Spartan Prag was it they were playing? I'm pretty yeah. sure we're playing against. Um, and he was racially abused. Now, obviously, no witnesses. The guy whispered it in his ear. It was pretty obvious that it was a, it was racial abuse. Um, but the case came to yourself. You represented them. Do you do you do you think there was a? Do you think that's been dealt with correctly, or do you think? I don't think it was. I don't think it was dealt correctly. I think UEFA was all very well about flying the flag and having the you know the black armbands and taking the knee and. Um, Black Lives Matter, but in reality, in practice, um, their the, the, the attitude and their disciplinary actions are tokenistic. Kudela received a 10-match ban, which he's still trying to appeal. I think it will be back up before April. But also, when you look at the backdrop to what happened, the diatribe of abuse and hate and threats that were made against Glenn within minutes after that, and that's subsequent to that, and myself as well, having to call in the police because I was bombarded on every social media platform possible, threatened in all sorts. Um, you know, for doing what? Doing my job, defend my client. At the end of the day, he said he was a victim of racist abuse 
And, um, and we highlighted that. And I have to say that um, the support of Stephen Gerrard and the rest of his team members was absolutely superb. And people did come together and it showed what is possible if you take racism seriously. And there's no, there is no water battery about this. And I know people, it doesn't make me popular, but that applies to every form of racism. You can't be selective about it. And that was as important because people said, oh, why are you doing this? I went, Glenn's my client. I'm representing him to the best of my abilities. I will defend him and do what I need to do to back that young player who grew up in Finland, son of an asylum seeker, horrific racism his family faced, came to London when he was 11 years old to get away with it, him and his sister and his mom, grew up in London, um, didn't really experience racism, complete mixed background of friends, professional football from the age of 15, and then to get to Glasgow Rangers, pinnacle of his achievement, and to be abused in such a manner on the international stage, knowing his mom and his family watching, was a huge shock to Glenn. Hit him, knocked him for six. And the point was, people said they wanted to make him a role model, an ambassador for fight raising women. Glenn just wants to get on with playing football. You know, people are sick to the back teeth of, if you're black, if you're Asian, that somehow you have to be leading the charge. The point is for other people to be doing it. And that's why for me, it's disappointing when you look at the cricket. You know, there's an investigation, an investigation, because I'm yet to see what they're actually doing. I want to see what are the real terms of reference. I want to see who the individuals are, how they're going to be robust. This is not about having a review and then you box it and say, oh, we've learned lessons. If you're going to do something about what happened in the past, then you take action. You don't just simply say, oh, we've reviewed it now and it's, it's, everything's fine. And what's disappointing even when I look at the cricket investigation is where are the allies? You know, when it comes to things like, let's say, women's issue, there needs to be allies. It's not for women to fight male violence, to fight rape and sexual violence. It's for men, men's responsibility. When it comes to homophobia, it's not for the gay community to fight, you know, violence against gay people or LGBTI. It's for the straight community to step in and say this is unacceptable. And when it comes to racism, it's not for Asian cricketers. It's not for black cricketers. It's not for black or Asian footballers to speak out against racism. It's for the white, you know, the, the white players, the white disciplinary bodies. And sadly, the disciplinary bodies have been lacking in their reaction. The SFA at the time called a big conference, a buha, where we're doing something together. What's happened since? What, what have they done? You know, where is it? Show me the action that they take against individuals that do it. Where is the robust action that they take? And until they actually start to hit them where it hurts, i.e. ban them for a year from playing. Don't ban them when the season's not on, because it doesn't count. I mean, I've seen that recently where somebody, was it Presswick, whoever, where it's like, you know, they're banned for several months and then they'll be back on once, this, you know, they'll be back into the, the club once the season starts. These things don't work. If you really want to hurt, then you hit them, first of all, with punishment. And the question is, Punishment, deterrent, and rehabilitation. That's the rules of the game for criminal justice. So first of all, you have to punish someone, but you also have to have the deterrent, knowing that people out there realize this is a punishment if you do something like that. And then the other issue that arises is rehabilitation. Now, of course, people can learn lessons from that. But first of all, you have to take action. And that's I, I, I don't actually see that happening. How do you think the, um, this investigation into in, institutional racism and cricket is is going to go? Do you, uh, you don't sound like you've got much confidence in it? Well, it's, it's, it's at early stages and I, I, I don't wish to see anonymity, but when I sent out an email the other day for Majid, um, what I got back was a computer generic, uh, Majid Hack, my client, you know, who left um, under a cloud of shame, was kicked out of the, the World Cup um, team because he used the words, it's tough being in a minority, which was factually correct. He then, you know, never ever plays cricket again for his national team. And then a year off, a year later, um, you know, he leaves, he leaves cricket. Sorry, stop that. We've actually done well that we've got this far without you getting a phone call, Emma. We're almost done anyway. I won't be holding you too much longer. Um, so it's a case of that, um, you know, a, a year later he leaves. And, and obviously I'm not like going... I mean, discussions, I've sent emails to, to Cricket Scotland and I've sent emails to the investigative body. Um, if they were genuine about this investigation, why would you not be proactive? And the first person you approach was the most high profile cricketer Scotland's ever had. The one who's been, the, the, you know, the, in the history of the Scottish team, the highest wicket taker and ask him what his problems were with racism. Ask him. What is what, why he thinks it's tough being in a minority? Why not approach Kasim Sheikh 
Why not speak to these individuals first off and say, we're going to do that? Why sit back and wait and say, here we have this unmined line, an email thing, and then it's like, what's your timeline? You expect to have this investigation over and done with July? How can you spend specify by July when you don't know what the problem is? That's like a murder investigation saying, we will have investigated this murder and we'll have it wrapped up by two weeks time. You don't know. You don't know, first of all, if you caught the killer. You don't know who's, who's, who's the suspects are. You haven't done the DNA. You haven't done the investigation. You haven't found out the motive. Um, you, 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 and if it's from several years before, of course, it's going to take longer because you have to trace people. You have to trace witnesses. These things take time. And at the moment, you know, I wait to see the proof. So I'm not going to be one of those that, you know, pats them on the back and says, well done, you guys. You know, um, uh, you know that, that's not how it works. Um, it, they're the ones, the shoulder, you know, response press on their shoulders. And that means that they should be reaching out length and breadth of the country. They should be writing to every single person of color and ask them, not just every person of color, they should be writing to every cricketer in Scotland, every team member, every, um, you know, trainer, every member of executive boards and asking them, what? I'm going to switch this off to a second. No, every person um, that is, um, oh, they're doing it on my end. <laughs> Not giving up, they're doing good it on content, Amor. This is good oh. content. This is uh, the one from Amor Anwar. So it's a case of like they are. They're, they're coming from every angle. Yeah. You know, that they have to be proactive and they have to deal with it. So there's, there's no ifs, there's no buts. That's, they, they have to come out but, and they have to prove themselves. Um, and they haven't proven themselves so far. It's almost been like slow to catch up as in Rafiq's case happens. And then eventually they get around to doing it up here. And it's almost like an embarrassing and they're putting out all their charters on the same day. And they go, what have you been doing up until now? And my, my view always with, with any institution organization is like, okay, first of all, show you my statistics. Show me how many cases you have of allegations of racism reported. Show me that, the statistics, and then show me what action you're taking. I can, you can bet your bottom dollar that in Scotland, it's probably actually zero or near zero. Now, if that's the case, then you have a problem. Or either you say you live in the post McPherson paradise and you have no problem at all with racism. And if you have no problem with racism, then, you, then why are they going for the tokenistic effort of showing we're going to fight racism? But if you've got zero, that means you, your bodies haven't done anything about it. And also, they often rely on the Asian cricketers or black cricketers to come forward and tell them. But it's difficult. If, you, if you're a young person who's desperate to play, why would you want to be in the firing line? Because you still got the hope that you might be selected one day. And of course, as you one year goes by, two years go by, three years go by, and we've seen it, Cass, and Majid's seen it, everybody's seen it. And you think, why are they getting on the team? Or they fit in better, or they've got better attitude. What's the better? How do you fit in better? What exactly is it that makes you fit in better? What's the better attitude? Yes, what, man. The drinking and the yes, parking, the eating yes, the bacon man. sarnies, taking part in the jokes, not having a chip on your shoulder. There's nothing about having a chip on. This is the same issue that applies to women's cricket. Same issue that applies to women's football, women's athletics. The idea that if women kick up a stink about sexism, about what they have to wear, let's say in certain fields of athletics and all that, that somehow, oh, you know, they're not playing the game. Now they are. It's the men that are. And in this case, it's the white institutions that aren't dealing with it appropriately. And they are yet to deliver anything that shows that they are serious about fighting racism. I haven't seen a single, single scalp. I haven't seen a single person kicked out of cricket. I have not seen, you know, a single person having real robust action taken other than action as in, well, you'll be back when the season starts. Are you not a bit disheartened sometimes that we're in 2022 and you've been battling racism and discrimination since the 80s and we're still having these conversations? Does that not sometimes dishearten you because it, it, it can get disheartening but as i said every so often something will happen that will inspire you for at least another year or two years and kevin your street's one of those moments yeah where you're right bang in the thick in the middle of it and your your belief in humanity is restored and you actually see ordinary people who 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 fight against the tide and stand up for principles and human rights and for justice and for equality and that's something i point because people always say to me you know, growing up with my family and uh, my parents, and they would say, oh, it's human nature. And I go, it's not, I don't believe it's human nature, because I know when I looked at my babies, they would crawl to anyone. They would hold anyone that gave them love and affection. They didn't differentiate the color of their skin because of their sexuality, because of, you know, their gender. They didn't differentiate that. 
It's only later on you learn it through schools and through society. So that means we've got an opportunity to change it. I don't think there's ever no hope. I always believe it's, it, I take it from root principles of when I first started being told by my lawyers in 1991, nobody has ever won a case against the police. And I said, just because they haven't, and I get told you have a one in a hundred thousand chance, that it's still one chance, isn't it? In a hundred thousand. You could still be that one person or that one out of 100,000 that actually could get there. People thought India would never be free. It was. People thought Africa would never get freedom, that the sun would never set on the British Empire. It did set on the British Empire. I mean, look at the state that this country is in under Boris Johnson just now. Wow. You know? And still there's this sense of arrogance. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, our parents, through their blood, sweat and tears, you know, sacrifice so much for this country and help to build this country. Yet for some reason, three, four, five generations on, we're still fighting for the right to exist and to survive. And that because of the color of our skin, our passports can be stripped away because of our heritage. It says it all. It's something that I never, ever believed when my parents used to say, one day we'll be kicked out of this country, son. Well, actually, the possibility is there now. They've actually allowing it to happen. Sadly, as the case... But we have role models like yourself. Um, is there, is there any, any? Do you see any young Amar Amars coming through? You mentioned Vakas earlier on. Is, is you know, do we have any characters coming through that are going to be that can continue? There's individuals who are coming through. I mean, I, I, I hope that we. I, I mean, I think I hope to see people who rise through the ranks. You know, we have individuals who are coming through in in um, in the legal profession. You know, we have uh, Sheriff Anwar, who's not any relation of mine, but is, a, um, you know, is the sheriff principal, uh, first Asian sheriff principal, one who has tremendous reputation, has got there on merit and hard work. But we're seeing people start to rise up to the ranks, we're starting to see that. Um, I'm, I'm still always conscious, though, of the fact that we have more of our community going into education. The problem, of course, becomes people aren't willing to rock the boat. Because if they rock the boat, they think it stops their advance. Yep. And that's where my concern lies. I want to see the political activists come through. And not everybody has to go and get the teeth smashed out to become one. I'm not saying that. But I mean, there's a different way of doing things. And it's people to realize um, that it was, a, it was a quote that I sent you, Kasim, during the weekend. Yeah, yeah. Um, about, I think Malcolm X, something about like, if a, if, if a knife is put into your back seven inches, do not expect me to be happy when you take it out, take it out six inches, take it out three inches or take it out one inch. You have to deal, you have to heal. You have to deal with the wound and you have to deal with why it was put there in the first place. And that, that healing process hasn't happened yet. There's a lot of work still to be done. Um, but the, the new batch that are coming up, um, um, that they're part of that process. You know, it's, it's at the end of the day, people in our community need to be able to turn to folk and know that there's going to be folk there who will raise these issues, who will fight for them. And, and, and to do that. And there's two different ways of doing it. There's always two different ways of doing it, but those sometimes two ways clash. Sometimes those two ways complement each other, um, but we're all going in the same direction is the way I see it. Amar Amar, it has been, you know, I can sit and listen to you, uh, you know, talking all day. Some of the some of the stuff you've talking about, although as well, it's, it's very emotional stuff and what people have gone through and the suffering that they've gone through for, that so many years, but the the resilience you have um, as a, as an individual um, and the drive that you have is just is is incredible and uh, you know you're such a big role model for for many of us South Asian people out there and um, that I'm sure look up to you and, and I'm sure there'll be some young boy or girl out there who seen what you did in Ken Muir Street that day and seen what the people of Glasgow done and got the passion in them that we, could, we want to go and do something like that one day in life. We want to stand and fight for the people. So thank you for that. Thank you for continuing to do what you do. Thank you very much for your time. Please do stay on for, for one second at the end. But yeah. Thanks for being consistent, You got me there in the end. A year and a half, but we got there in the end. Thank you.